Virginia, did you know the law protects patients from surprise medical bills? Insurance companies and hospitals post cost information online. You can request a good faith estimate three days ahead of hospital care. Know your rights as a healthcare consumer. Visit controlyourcare.com to learn more about patient-focused healthcare laws. Controlyourcare.com can help empower your healthcare decisions. Paid for by the Virginia Hospital and Healthcare Association. Hey, Brian. Hey, Mishi. How are you doing? I'm doing great. So where, where are we, Brian? We're standing in front of some nice eucalyptus trees and in front of a car. Your car. My car, yeah. I see that it says Better Place 100% Electric right on the driver's door. Exactly. So this is the car that the Israeli startup Better Place sold. This is a 100% electric car. That means that there's no gasoline engine in it at all. There's just an electric engine in the front and a great big battery in the back that fills up like half the trunk. So should we go for a drive? Yeah. Okay, so here we are. We're in the car. Right, and I'm going to start the car. First, I'm going to punch in the secret code. Now I'm going to turn the car on. Are you ready? Yep. Wait, that's it? That's it. That's The car's on. Do you hear anything? The car is now on? The car is on. This is the amazing thing about an all-electric car, is there is absolutely no noise. Wow. Okay, so should we start driving? Yeah, but we have a, we have a special passenger. My wife Jody is about to get in the car. Hey Jody, how you doing? Good, thank you. It's a sad day though. <laughs> Saying goodbye to something. Hey, I'm Mishi Harman, and this is Israel Story. Israel Story is brought to you by PRX and is produced together with Tablet Magazine. So you heard Jody mention that it was a sad day for her, that she was saying goodbye to something near and dear. And well, folks, today's show is a little different than our usual ones. See, our main character, the one Jody was parting with, isn't exactly Israeli. Or at least isn't exactly an Israeli person. No, no, no. The hero of our story today is a car. A car that many hoped would take over the world. But our episode is also about a group of Israelis, not many, maybe about a thousand, who developed an almost religious passion for that car and would do basically anything to keep that relationship alive. Brian and Jody Blum from Jerusalem bought their 100% electric Renault Fluent ZE from an Israeli company called Better Place in 2012. They were among the first customers. I wanted an electric car from this company, Better Place. The second I read about it, in the introduction to the book Startup Nation by Saul Singer and Dan Senor, They started their entire story about how amazing and different Israel is as a place of entrepreneurship and innovation by telling the story of Better Place. And I read that and I said, when this company is real and when they're selling cars, we've got to get one. Luckily for Brian, he wasn't alone. Here's Jody. It was a dream of mine to have one. So we went and test drove this car and we decided pretty much on the spot that we were buying it. Brian and Jody never looked back. They were thrilled with their purchase. I love the car. Really love this car. Love the way that it drives. Love the fact that it's, you know, all electric. Love the fact that we were pioneers. Do you think you're more invested in your car than most people are in their cars? No, for sure, for sure. It wasn't just by chance that the story of Better Place, the electric car company that sold the Blums their Fluent ZE, opened up the best-selling book Startup Nation. Not that long ago, Better Place symbolized the future. It was the Israeli promise and pride. It was worth billions, at least on paper, and it was going to change the world as we knew it. 
In 2007, long before Tesla and Elon Musk became household names, a 39-year-old Israeli entrepreneur by the name of Shai Agassi came out with an announcement that rattled the world. He was going to revolutionize transportation, make countries oil-free by 2020, and curb the effects of climate change. Agassi was going to put millions and millions of drivers, all around the globe, behind the wheel of an inexpensive electric car with virtually unlimited range. And that, he told anyone who would listen, was going to make the world a better place. It didn't take long before that radical utopian idea made Agassi a rock star. Bill Clinton was giving him advice, Shimon Peres was singing his praises, he was on the cover of countless magazines and a guest on all the major talk shows. The sustainable future he described was at once rosy and green. Brian Blum is a Jerusalem-based journalist and the author of a new book about Better Place. He's going to tell us why this idea, why this car really, generated such excitement and inspired such devotion, and why its end was so devastating. Act 1. The Promise I first learned about Better Place back in 2009, when its charismatic CEO, Shia Gassi, hit the TED stage in Monterey, California. Here he is. So how would you run a whole country without oil? That's the question that uh, sort of hit me in the middle of a Davos afternoon about four years ago. At the time, Agassi was a successful Israeli technology executive and a member of a group called the Forum of Young Global Leaders that met every year in Davos, Switzerland. The group had been charged with answering a seemingly simple question. How can you make the world a better place? Agassi ran with that question, establishing a company called Better Place. If you could convert an entire country to electric cars in a way that is convenient and affordable, you could get to a solution. Shai Agassi's solution was to create the world's first affordable all-electric car. That meant that you wouldn't need a single drop of oil to run it. Now, this wasn't a new idea, but all previous attempts had fallen short. Electric cars were simply too expensive, and they couldn't overcome the issue of range anxiety. Range anxiety is one of the things that the non-electric car driving public think matters above all else. They think you drive around in a perpetual state of worrying that you're going to stop. That's Brian Thomas. He's originally from London and now lives in Tel Aviv where he works as a computer importer. He also owns a Better Place car. And he is talking about one of the biggest obstacles that prevented electric cars pre-Better Place, from reaching a mass market. You see, drivers couldn't get beyond the fear that an electric car would run out of juice in the middle of nowhere, unable to move another inch before they were plugged in. After all, an electric car runs on a lithium-ion battery, just like the one in your cell phone or your laptop, only bigger. And those batteries drain down fast, especially if you use your air conditioning or the windshield wipers or you had a lot of hills to climb. Shai Gassi was going to solve that problem. His idea? Battery switch stations. But before he could change the world, he needed to prove his concept actually worked. And that's where Israel came in. Agassi's plan was to turn Israel into what's known in the high-tech world as a beta site. First, Better Place would blanket the country with plug-in charge spots. Half a million of them were planned. And then they'd build an extensive network of battery switch stations. This would allow Agassi to sell hundreds of thousands of cars in Israel alone. Mind you, the entire population of Israel at the time was just over 7 million. Here's how Agassi described the switch stations on the TED stage. It looks like a car wash. You come into your car wash and a plate comes up, holds your battery, takes it out, puts it back in. And within two minutes, you're back on the road and you can go again. You drive into a mini tunnel. You kind of position your wheels to go in the, the right lane. Ya'ara Segni is an editor at a women's magazine. She was one of the first Israelis to buy a Better Place electric car. I met up with her in her swanky Tel Aviv office. And then you kind of hear a little bit of clanking noises and the robot underneath pulls out the battery, puts a new battery in, and 
closes everything and then you're kind of free to move forward. It was an amazing technology. The feeling of driving into that station, the full automation was very impressive. I mean, it was just, it was just space age. Switching battery was the coolest thing on the planet. I loved it. I loved it. But it wasn't just the space age switch stations. There were other innovations that addressed the menace of range anxiety. One of the things Better Place had right from the start was a pretty good prediction system. Destination. You put in your destination. Calculating. And it told you what's your percentage going to be when you get there. Seven percent at final stop. It could plot a multi-stop trip via the switch stations, filling up with a brand new battery at each one. And you got wherever you wanted to go. It was wonderful. In order to turn Israel into the land of milk, honey, and electricity, Agassi had to make some powerful allies. His first step was converting then-president Shimon Peres into a passionate electric car advocate. Here's Peres talking about the car in a Better Place promotional video. You know, the calculation of what is cheap and what is expensive is wrong. Because expensive is things that pollute our life. Cheap is things that makes our life better and cleaner. We decided to be first to introduce an electric car that doesn't pollute. Agassi then began talking to various car manufacturers about building his dream vehicle. Better Place would create the infrastructure, the switch stations and the charge spots, and would partner with an established car maker that would build the vehicle itself. Most of the car companies wanted to sell Agassi the hybrid cars they were already manufacturing. But one of them, Carlos Ghosn, CEO of Renault and Nissan, when asked about hybrids, said something very fascinating. He said, hybrids are like mermaids. When you want a fish, you get a woman, and when you need a woman, you get a fish. (laughs) Agassi committed to buying 100,000 units of a car from Renault called the Fluence, which was then in development. Renault would modify the gasoline-powered model and add ZE to the end for zero emissions. Now, in order to bring the cost of the car down, Agassi decided to think not so much like a car manufacturer, but rather as a cell phone provider. So what does that mean? Well, his idea was that when you bought a Better Place car, you would get the car, but Better Place would own the battery. It was sort of like buying a mobile phone and then paying AT&T for the minutes. In Better Place's case, the minutes were your electricity, which included plugging into your charge spot at home or at work and all the battery swaps you needed all for a low monthly subscription fee. The early response was ecstatic. Over the course of the next four years, Better Place raised a whopping $850 million at a valuation of $2.3 billion. That's billion with a B. Once Better Place took off, it seemed like nothing could stop it. The company opened offices not only in Israel, but also in Denmark, the Netherlands, Japan, China, Canada, Palo Alto, and Hawaii. Meanwhile, Agassi's TED Talk had a major impact on other players in the Israeli high-tech industry. One of them was Yosef Abramowitz, a pioneer of solar power in Israel. After hearing him speak, I was like, oh my God, the state of Israel, the state of Israel, we can be the first, not just on the transportation, but also on energy, to go from burning fossil fuels to being powered by green technologies. So I quickly went over to Shai and I was like, look, two thirds of the greenhouse gas emissions in the state of Israel are from power plants and one third is from transportation. Let's figure out how to work together and zero all that out and be an example for us of the world. Before long, Better Place opened a visitor center north of Tel Aviv where the public could test drive a fully electric car. Over the next several years, 80,000 people, politicians, celebrities, students on school outings, college kids on birthright trips, all made the pilgrimage to the center. Actors Ashton Kutcher and Demi Moore showed up. So did Leonardo DiCaprio and his then-girlfriend, Israeli supermodel, Bar Raffaele. The visitor center was really an amazing place. That's Tal Bar who was Better Place's top salesperson. Our uh, title (laughs) was uh, Switchers, yes, because that was our goal, to switch you from a gasoline car to an electric one. There was a huge uh, like cinema with refurbished uh, car seats. That's where visitors would be introduced to the Better Place vision. It was detailed in a movie that was as inspiring as it was over the top. 
complete with polar bears, melting ice caps, and a holographic projection of Shyagasi. Over the past 100 years, virtually everything we do has been transformed by technological innovation. And yet, our cars are still powered by the same platform designed over 100 years ago. We drive faster and further, but we still rely on an internal combustion engine running on gasoline made from oil. It's time to ask ourselves, is the transportation model that was good for us at the beginning of the last century appropriate for the world that we live in today? Put it all together, and what you have is a switch from a pump to the plug. We're ready. The car is ready. The infrastructure is ready. The solution is ready for you to consume. The question is, are you ready to switch? Ready to pop the question? The jewelers at BlueNile.com have got sparkle down to a science with beautiful lab-grown diamonds worthy of your most brilliant moments. Their lab-grown diamonds are independently graded and guaranteed identical to natural diamonds, and they're ready to ship to your door. Go to BlueNile.com and use promo code LISTEN to get $50 off your purchase of $500 or more. That's code LISTEN at BlueNile.com for $50 off. BlueNile.com, code LISTEN. Okay, so as you could hear in that promotional video of theirs, there was a lot of hype around Better Place. I mean, a switch from the pump to the plug? That's some good copy right there. Suddenly, Better Place was everywhere. Shai Agassi thinks he knows how to make the world a better place. His company is Better Place. The founder and CEO of Better Place. A partnership with Better Place. Project Better Place and Israeli-American company. People at Better Place believe they're the ones who know how to go the next step. Shai Agassi was on Time Magazine's list of the 100 most influential people in the world. He had meetings at the White House, and Bill Clinton even wrote that Better Place, quote, serves as an example of how businesses can prosper while also serving humanity. Everything, it seemed, was going their way, and nothing could stop them. Act 2, Car Meets Driver. Here's Brian again. Fast forward to the summer of 2012. Everything seems set for Better Place to convert Israel into a nation of electric car drivers. The switch station network was opening, the first customers were buying their cars, and they couldn't have been more enthusiastic. I still remember the first time we test drove the car. We sat in the car, and uh, the salesperson said, turn on the engine, turn the key. That's Yara Desegni again the women's magazine editor, who was one of the first Better Place car owners. We heard nothing, and he said, the engine's on, look, there's like a green go on the dash, and if you put it in drive and press the pedal, it will move, and it did, and it was absolutely amazing. My wife Jody also remembers that first test drive. In turn, they gave each of us a chance to sit in the driver's seat and drive, and they encouraged us very much to put the pedal to the floor and to go as fast as we can, and it was extremely exciting, and I felt a charge in my body, and I felt I need to have this car. Brian Thomas loved the speed of his new electric car. I used to drive and race cars in the UK, where I'm from. Uh, the last car I had in England before I left was an Alfa Romeo. The one before that was an MG. I couldn't come here and buy an electric car. They're golf carts. But then we got to test drive the car, and I put my foot down. The car just leapt forward in a way that I'd never felt in anything except very expensive, very fast racing cars. I could feel it immediately, this throttle response that you, you don't get in petrol cars. And I felt this thing whoosh. And I thought, that's odd. This feels different. And I was sold and I bought one. It wasn't only the quiet ride, the incredible speed and the futuristic battery switching stations that were generating tremendous excitement. For many people, buying an electric car was also about saving money. My name is Itai Cohen. I'm a 3D artist, and I drive a better place car, and I love it. Itai used to drive more than 100 kilometers a day to get to and from work. He was paying over 4,000 shekels a month just for gas, 
which he says was a big chunk of his salary. I was trying to see how could I economize better my travels. I knew I could save at least a thousand shekels a month. And uh, this was like a win-win for me. It was the new technology, a uh, thing that I believe in, and, and I can save a lot of money. So for me, it was a no-brainer. I, can, I could just do my, my stuff. There was also a kind of national pride that Israel, the startup nation, was doing something on such a grand scale. Saul Singer co-wrote the book Startup Nation. So we call Israel the startup nation because it has more startups than anywhere outside of Silicon Valley. Better Place was a very unusual startup. It was very ambitious. And actually, startups do usually have a global ambition. But uh, Better Place was especially ambitious in terms of taking on big industries like transportation, energy, and so on. And what's more, Better Place stood out in its commitment to provide the kind of customer service you don't usually find in Israel. Friendly and helpful phone operators were available to answer questions 24-7. In fact, they were so nice and accommodating that some drivers, Effie Shachach, for instance, started calling in with non-car-related requests. If you just call the service center at 2 o'clock at night and just ask about a restaurant, they say, no problem, just wait for a moment and they will give you the open cafe or the restaurants and you can go there. Once we were on our way home from a wedding. That's my wife Jody again. And we had to switch once on the way home. We came to the station. It was unmanned. The station shutter opened up for us. And at some point during the process of the swapping of the battery, the mechanics broke down and the whole entire system stopped. So we could not leave and get home or do anything because there was nobody there to work on it. It would take them hours. We were on the phone with them and they told us it's not something we can fix right now. However, there is a spare car sitting in the lot and we are going to explain to you now how to get the keys to that spare car out of the locked office. And um, the next day, they supplied us the service of bringing our car back with a fully charged battery and took the spare car away. Another time, Effie had a flat tire. It was Friday afternoon in Tel Aviv. And I say, okay, what I'm going to do now? Because, you know, there's no spare wheel in the car. That's right. Renault had left out the spare tire because almost all the space in the trunk was taken up by the car's enormous electric battery, which was the size of a kitchen table and weighed nearly 700 pounds. So I called the service center and I say, no problem. We'll find you a place. They found me a place in Jaffa, about uh, 10 minutes from there. They call the store there and they tell them that one of our customers are going to come. And if you have the exact will that you can change it, and they say, yes, no problem. We're going to wait for him. It was about five afternoon. Usually on Friday, five afternoon, you will find nothing in Tel Aviv open. You can't get service like this. By the summer of 2012, the buzz surrounding Better Place had reached a peak. The switch stations were going up all around the country, and the company was the talk of the town. But this is where our story takes a turn. The whole operation was enormously expensive, and even though the public didn't know it, Better Place was bleeding money. They needed to increase sales, fast. That's when they released their first TV commercial. Let's just say that it wasn't what people had expected. She's not for everyone. Only for people who won't accept things as they are. She's not everyone's kind of thing. Just for those who are fed up with unstable gas prices. Not everyone's going to love her. Only the ones who no longer want to poison the air that we breathe. She's definitely not going to be love at first sight. Except for those who want great performance without the fuss. She's not for everyone. Only for those who believe they have the right to make the world a better place. Okay, back to Brian and Act 3, The Fall. The Better Place commercial had kind of an Apple think different feel to it. Because the people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones 
who do. But it was not well received. Effie Shachak, for example, the guy with the flat tire, felt that Better Place had gotten its messaging all wrong. Maybe they try to say to the people, not everybody can drive this car. Only special people. I think this was wrong. Because this car, it's not like Tesla in the United States, for example, it's for rich people. This car was for the regular people, people that go to work, drive to work, drive to the supermarket, go to visit their friends. Aside from being elitist and sexist, the ad campaign also made it clear that the car wasn't going to be as cheap as the public had been led to believe. After all, in his original TED Talk, Agassi had said, Affordable is not a $40,000 sedan. But the price of the first Fluence ZE? Just under $40,000. The expectation in the market here in Israel was that the electric car was going to be cheaper for the consumer in every way. That's Yosef Abramowitz, the solar energy pioneer. There was a lot of hype and anticipation. And so finally, when the rollout happened, uh, the price of the car was a sticking point and really helped undermine the enthusiasm of the market. Shelley Silverstein was also shocked by the price. She headed up Better Place Israel's HR department. The initial expectation, she recalls, was... It will be affordable for a student, a soldier, a young couple, a retired person. That was the mantra. But the price was far from affordable. Tal Bar, Better Place's top salesman, remembers the day the prices were first announced. It was harsh. I can say that people were very, very disappointed once they heard the prices of the car. They expected something that would be, you know, substantially cheaper than a gas car. The majority of Israelis are not um, driven by the green, uh, the environment, but the green in the, you know, the, the pockets. You know, it has to make sense economically. But as an insider, Tal also knew what Better Place's expenses were. Better Place had to buy the battery in advance, buy the charge spot, do all the engineering, install the charge spot, deploy battery switch stations all over the country. All of this stuff really costs a lot of money. This is what we need in order to really cover the investment. Better Place had predicted that thousands of cars would be sold in the first year alone. But in the initial months, just a few hundred cars left the visitor center. Still, Shai Agassi wasn't too worried. In his eyes, it's like he's a little bit uh, living ahead of time of everybody else, you know, a little bit in the future. Yet it wasn't just the price that was scaring off buyers. It's incredibly conservative here on buying new innovation. Brian Thomas, the former race car driver again. In fact, until America's been using something for five years, the Israeli public is just not interested. So we're, we're the startup nation for creating this stuff, but not for being the early adopters. If you're trying to launch a new car into the market, it will take you about five years from the day you actually made the concept. That's Yoav Hechal, who was then Better Place's chief engineer. Unfortunately for us, the Fluence, when it was launched into the market, it was not very attractive. The car itself had some idiosyncrasies. The small trunk, for instance. The trunk is not exactly the best. I'm very good at uh, stuffing a lot of things in very small spaces. I do that with my freezer all the time. So I did learn to put like a weekly shop in that trunk. But yes, it is small. Then there was the issue of the switch station locations Better Place had selected. Many of them weren't convenient, situated far from the main commuter highways, behind factories, and in one case, next to a city dump. Yoav Hechal, the chief engineer, explains why that happened. The problem in Israel was that we tried to really deploy the station as fast as we can. So in many cases, we compromised and we actually took some sort of an industrial real estate. The downsides were that when people started using the cars, uh, they were a little bit disappointed with the locations of the stations. Even environmentalists, whom you might have expected would have gotten behind the better place message of weaning the world off oil, hesitated. Yosef Abramowitz tried, unsuccessfully, to rally the green troops. It was too slick for them. It was too corporate. It was too big business feeling. Perhaps the billion dollars Better Place had raised made the company seem more like ExxonMobil than Greenpeace. We're kind of homegrown, organic people, uh, grassroots and build up. And it didn't work. It was too 
suspicious in the eyes of the environmental movement. None of these problems should have been insurmountable had the company kept costs low. After all, they'd raised the money. But they were also spending it quite freely. Shelley Silverstein, the HR executive, recalls the prevailing atmosphere in the company. We've got a lot of money uh, and we're going to last forever. Yoav Hechel agrees. We need more money, no problem. We'll go to somebody else and we'll, we'll explain why we need it and we'll get it. So it was always, I would say, the spirit of the company that money doesn't matter. Time matters. So if we can buy time with money, we should do it. So if we need to drill a hole in the station and we need to do it now, we will pay five times more than that in order to get it now instead of tomorrow. Almost every facet of the operation, all the way from installing a charge spot in a customer's garage to building a new switch station, went over budget. At the rate at which it was spending, Better Place, which had been synonymous with success and futuristic thinking, was running out of money. Only a few hundred cars had been sold, and something had to give. And so, just after Yom Kippur 2012, the company's founder, Shai Agassi, was fired. It came as a complete shock to the Better Place staff. Shai was the face and living heart of Better Place. How could they fire him? He was Better Place. It doesn't make sense. Like, what is this? You cannot have better place without Shai Agassi. I mean, it's his, uh, it's his idea, it's his work, it's his baby. And it was a very sad moment for everybody. People crying and uh, really, it was tough. What few electric car sales there were basically stopped once Agassi was out. Better Place's existing investors injected yet another $100 million to keep the company going as a last gasp. A new CEO was hired, then fired, and then another. But it was too little, too late. With Agassi gone, Better Place had lost not only its heart, but also the public's trust. Just over six months later, on May 26, 2013, Better Place filed for bankruptcy. When a company worth $2.3 billion goes belly up in just over five years, you'd think that every single Better Place car owner would say, I'm out of here. Run to the nearest car dealership and try to offload their $40,000 paperweight. But that's not what happened. Not at all. Act 4. The Holdouts. When Better Place went bankrupt, something remarkable occurred. Drivers refused to stop believing in the vision of an electric car future. Drivers like Brian Thomas, Yara Desegni, and Effie Shachak. I'm driving the car every day. I've done five years and 60,000 kilometers in it and enjoyed it. I drive my wife's diesel car from time to time. And I can't believe I have to get out of the thing, pick up this horribly smelly diesel nozzle and put it in the car and stand there while it glug, 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 and then hand over 400 shekels for the privilege. I mean, it's awful. And it smells and you get it on your hands and you drop it on your feet. It's the whole process of filling up a petrol or a diesel car is atrocious. I think certainly the first wave of people who bought those cars really believed in the vision. It meant something more than, than just four wheels. We love the car. We love it also right now. Even we have so much problems driving it. But it's a fantastic car, really. The experience of driving such a quiet car with uh, all its technology, it was amazing. The drivers really led the way. It was very inspiring. They reminded me of the early Apple users, um, where there was just this this sense of being part of a movement. The driver's commitment inspired Yosef Abramowitz. He teamed up with Effie Shachak, who was by now the founder of a non-profit group called the Association of Electric Car Drivers in Israel, and the two put in a bid to buy Better Place's assets. Yosef would bring the money. Effie would run the company. Yara Desegni joined them too. Their goal was to keep Better Place going. 
When Better Place collapsed, we had like an emergency meeting and about 50 drivers turned up. It was basically a pep rally that we can do this. We can really forge a new destiny for this wonderful idea. And from that, a lot of people came forward and saying, OK, I can help with this part. I can help with this part. But how could this trio, however well-intentioned, succeed where nearly a billion dollars of investment had failed? Our job was, could we save the system and keep it operational at a million dollars a month? At a million dollars a month, Better Place 2.0 could have operated, could have stabilized, and could have grown organically. There was no problem. Everything was going, we operate the switching uh, battery station, we operating the electric spots everywhere. We have all the drivers driving with these cars for another month. There was no problem to operate the company. But there actually was a snag, a big one. The problem was the cash flow. Yosef's investors weren't able to come up with the money in time, and 350 cars that he had hoped to sell to generate some extra income were stuck at the Ashdod port, buried under red tape. Effie recalls what happened next. We went to the liquidators and I said to yourself, listen, this is the end. We don't have the money. We don't have the cash flow. We need to pay salary. We need to pay for the suppliers. We can't continue like this. Another company tried to buy Better Place. It failed too. With no one left to run day-to-day operations, the switch stations were soon shuttered. But the Better Place drivers still refused to stop driving. Let me try and give you a sense of how unusual this is. We all know people that get attached to obsolete machines or technologies. Barack Obama famously held on to his BlackBerry long into the iPhone age. But this was different. It became a real pain in the neck to own a Better Place car. Just think of it. No switch stations, no spare parts if the car breaks down, no one to call if you're having problems. Who needs all that hassle? You can't drive even from Tel Aviv to Haifa or from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. If you don't have a place to charge the car for another few hours, you can't do it. But the stubborn Better Place drivers wouldn't give up, even if it meant implementing some highly creative solutions. Before long, drivers started helping each other out. An electric plug-sharing network sprouted up on social media. The Facebook group was very active for a while, and we have to this day a WhatsApp group. Somebody says, you know, I'm driving to so-and-so and I'll need a couple of hours charge. Who can help? A couple of times people have shown up at my house and plugged their car in for a couple of hours so they can get somewhere they otherwise couldn't have done. I had a project in uh, Bet Shemesh. So to make uh, both way with the electric car, I have to charge the uh, car in Bet Shemesh. One of the association members, he lived in Bet Shemesh. So I went to his home, I charged the car in his home, took a cab, go to the customer, go back and take the car. It was amazing that people voluntarily give other people to charge in their uh, home. Another program that Better Place drivers created was dubbed the Pony Express. Say I have to drive quite a long distance, I'll drive to your house, I'll leave you my car charging, I'll take your car and carry on. And like the concept of the Pony Express, of changing the horses and continuing on. You know, it's amazing, you can't really explain this, that a bunch of people that bought these cars and said, we are going to continue driving this car. It doesn't matter that there's no company here. <laughs> no one supports us, but we love so much this car. So at this way, we, you know, we continue driving for the ne- next uh, three years. For Effie Yara and the rest of them, the Better Place dream lives on. But for the people who worked at Better Place, there was nowhere left to go. It was the highlight of my career, and I really felt that we were doing something unique, something historical. Uh, It's like almost recreating or rebuilding the 16th chapel or some kind of uh, world wonder. There is no uh, week that passes, and I don't think about that period of time. I've seen uh, amazing things during those five years. It was like a roller coaster. It was uh, the happiest uh, time of my life, maybe, to actually put these cars on the road and really see this vision that uh, we've been talking about actually becoming a reality. 
And still today, whenever I see an electric car, I smile. And then I <laughs> think of, oh, poor guy, he doesn't have battery switch stations. And then I'm not so happy. Despite the fact that the company didn't exactly end up in the better place people had hoped it would, no one I spoke to, neither car owners nor employees, regretted having taken part in the electric experiment. This is how our society advances. People come up with new ideas and we test them in this marketplace. And the good ones succeed. We have iPhones and then along comes the Androids to push the iPhones forward and, and so on. But you've got to have those initial ideas. You've got to have people with boldness and vision to try them. And I, I think the world is a better place for trying these things. Saul Singer, the author of Startup Nation, knows a thing or two about successes and failures in Israel. As a country, we're more willing to take risk. We're more willing to be entrepreneurs. We're more willing to fail because we know that without failure, there's no success. Am I still happy I bought the car knowing everything that happened? Yes. I am because leaving aside, obviously, the financial loss and driving myself crazy for years, not being able to go places, I believe it is the way of the future. And I think it was an amazing thing that was done. Do I regret it? Absolutely not. I know that if I buy a normal car, it's not going to lead me anywhere. Interesting. Whereas the better place car led me to amazing places. I wanted to be able to tell my grandchildren, yes, we started this revolution here in Israel. And you know what? I still hope it will happen, and I'm sure it will happen. So maybe you remember that at the very beginning of the episode, when I was sitting in the car with Brian and Jody, Jody said that it was a sad day. You might be wondering why. Well, after we'd already finished recording all the interviews for this story, there was one final plot twist. A group of about 250 holdout Better Place drivers asked Renault, the car manufacturer, to replace their quickly degrading batteries. Renault said no, they didn't have any new batteries to give out. So the drivers sued. And believe it or not, Renault folded. They offered the drivers a pretty good deal. They'd buy back their cars for about half the original price. Brian and Jody knew their battery would soon be completely unusable, and decided to take the deal. And that's how, on a hot day of early summer, I found myself in their electric car on its final trip, from the Blum's house in the leafy Jerusalem neighborhood of Baca to the nearby Talpiot industrial zone. Our destination? The local Renault dealership, where Brian and Jody were going to return their beloved fluids. I feel pretty emotional about it. It's funny, I don't think most people would say that they feel emotional about giving back a car. People do not give back cars. They sell their cars, they trade in their cars. Now, lots of us can probably relate to the feeling of being attached to a car. My very first car was a 1973 light blue Volkswagen Beetle. It broke down almost every time I drove it, but I just loved it. In fact, I loved it so much that it's still parked in my grandma's driveway, even though it hasn't moved at all since 2004. So, I get it. But this, this was a whole different kind of attachment. <laughs> Should I tell you how sad I am? Because <laughs> I am. It's a sad day for me. I, I'm going to walk away from here grieving. It was a wonderful idea. And it's, yeah, it's leaving me. We are actually at this very moment driving onto the Renault lot. This is crazy. People buy and sell cars all the time. This is not a funeral. Why are we so sad? It's okay. Good things will come of it. All right, you ready to turn off the car for the last time? Here we go. Ready? With that anticlimactic click, Brian and Jody got out of their car, walked into the heavily air-conditioned showroom, and handed over the keys to an elegantly dressed Renault representative. They signed some forms, drank a cup of water, took some last pictures of themselves in front of their old car, and walked home. Jody 
Just last week, Brian told me, they got a new car. A Suzuki crossover. It runs on gas. Brian Blum's new book about Better Place is called Totaled, the billion dollar crash of the startup that took on big auto, big oil, and the world. It comes out this week and is available on Amazon and wherever else you buy your books. We're also going to have a link to it on our site. I've read Brian's book, and it is really, really phenomenal. It's full of many, many more staggering stories about Better Place than we could include in this episode, and I highly recommend it. For more info, visit brianblum.com. That's B R I A N. B-L-U-M dot com We reached out, of course, to Shai Agassi, Better Place's founder and first CEO. He agreed to meet with us and we chatted for a while, but ultimately he decided not to participate in our story. And that's our episode. You can hear all our previous episodes on our site, israelstory.org, or by searching for Israel Story on iTunes and any of the other main podcast platforms. Don't forget, if you can, to rate us and write a review on iTunes. Apparently that really helps us reach new listeners. You can also follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all under Israel Story. And if you too would like to sponsor episodes of Israel Story, it's easy. Just email us at sponsor at prx.org. The music in today's episode featured original tracks composed and performed by the bard from Be'er Sheva, David Peretz. The episode was edited by Julie Subrin and mixed by Sela Weisblum. Thanks to Rachel Fisher, Dima Perevoshikov, Eve Snyder, and Kate Bulger for her wise legal advice. Israel Story is brought to you by PRX, the public radio exchange, and is produced in partnership with Tablet Magazine. Our staff includes Shai Satran, Roy Gilron, Yochai Meital, Maya Kosover, Zev Levi, and Aviva de Kornfeld. This is actually Aviva's very last episode with us, and we'll miss her a lot. But don't worry, you'll get to hear her voice later on in the season. I'm Mishi Harman, and we'll be back very soon with a brand new and hopefully delicious Israel Story episode. So till then, yalla bye.